Florence is sweeping through the Carolinas. We're going to keep you updated with critical reports throughout the hour. And now Democrats scrambling with their 11th hour smears against Brett Kavanaugh. Plus, new explosive page struck texts blow the lid open on a media FBI loop that looks like it was meant to take Trump out from the beginning. Oh, that's a shock. And Maxine Waters compares Trump's immigration policy to, you guessed it, slavery. All that ahead. And of course, the Friday Follies with Raymond Arroyo. So stick around for that. But first, let's go right to Fox News correspondent Steve Harrigan, who's in North uh, Topsail Beach in North Carolina. Steve, what do you see? Laura, outside of the camera lights and police lights, much of this part of the coast of North Carolina is in the dark. More than 500,000 North Carolinians without electric power, many in homes that have been damaged by the winds, damaged by flooding. That means they have no air conditioning, no TV, no cell phone service, and some of them are in life-threatening conditions. Now, the rescues have begun already. People coming from around the country, swift boat rescue teams from at least 19 states here. That's one of the remarkable things about these storms. It really brings out the volunteers from all over. The police chief here said they're going to set out at first light to see some areas they have not yet seen. We finally gotten a break after 30 hours from that pounding rain and wind. That wind strong enough to damage houses along the coast. Not major structural damage, but bits and pieces. Uh, some parts of roofs, balconies, things like that blown off, making the roads very treacherous for travel. But they'll start out tomorrow morning to try and help those people who, as those floodwaters continue to rise here across the state. Laura, back to you. All right, Steve, thanks so much. Stay safe. And now let's get to Fox News correspondent Rick Leventhal, who's in Wilmington, North Carolina. Rick. And Laura, I just want to update Steve's numbers. There are now roughly 800,000 customers across North Carolina without power, including, as far as we can tell, everyone here in Wilmington. Uh, Wrightsville Beach was in the dark as well, where we were uh, for the last few days. And the water there today rose to the highest it's ever been, almost five feet above high tide. So the roads there were completely flooded uh, for hours today and a lot of homes put at risk. Uh, we drove from there into a neighborhood just on the other side of the intercoastal and saw dozens of trees that had toppled. Uh, a lot of branches down and, and big old trees, some of them 50 years old or more, that were blocking roads. They weren't letting anyone in except residents and tree companies because they need to clear all that debris out of the way. The roads, treacherous, many f uh, flooded areas and and the traffic lights are all out. We saw straight troopers at a lot of intersections because there's no traffic lights working in this part of North Carolina, and they expect things to continue to get worse. The trees coming down it is a bigger problem than people might realize. A tree fell on a house here in Wilmington earlier today and killed a woman and her infant child, and the husband was also injured. He was taken to the hospital, but two of the five dead were from a tree coming down, and someone else died when they were trying to plug in a generator and plug in an extension cord. So a lot of the, the hazards come, Laura, as you know, after the hurricane passes. But by the way, it's still storming out here. We had a band come through minutes ago that was almost as ferocious as the hurricane itself. So they're expecting more of these bands to come through as the night goes on and the rain to continue for two or three more days. So the flooding hazards will continue for a while here. Uh, thanks so much, Rick. Rick and Steve, two of the hardest working reporters out there covering Hurricane Florence, and we'll continue to bring you live updates from North Carolina throughout the hour. Meanwhile, the Me Too movement has become, let's face it, a powerful force as victims have come forward to make accusations against those who they say abuse them. We've seen this in Hollywood, major figures taken out, the media, major figures taken out, and politics, ditto. First-hand accounts backed up by witnesses have led to some of the accused admit their guilt in the end. Which brings us to the latest charges against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Now, in this case, no one has come forward and witnesses dispute the charge. But the New Yorker is reporting allegations of an unnamed woman who claims that Kavanaugh, while in high school, tried to force himself upon her. Now, Kavanaugh is ve vehemently denying it took place in high school at, or at any time. And the only other corroborating witness has no recollection of it whatsoever. So what are we left with? A nearly four decades old anonymous charge 
released late in the game. Now, remember we told you last night that Senator Dianne Feinstein had a letter containing allegations back in July related to this. Well, she chose to sit on it. So she let Brett Kavanaugh go through a series of Senate meetings, three days worth of uh, seemingly unending testimony on the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee and answer 263 pages worth of follow up questions. But now, at the last minute, the Democrats drop this bombshell on him and some of these media people just lap it up. It's, it's all eerily reminiscent of what the Democrats did to my old boss, Clarence Thomas, 25 plus years ago after a leaked FBI memo, they reopened his confirmation proceedings so that they could basically publicly humiliate Thomas and his family. How would any member on this committee, any person in this room, or any person in this country would like sleaze said about him or her in this fashion, or this dirt dredged up in this gossip and these lies displayed in this manner. How would any person like it? The Supreme Court is not worth it. No job is worth it. I'm not here for that. I'm here for my name, my family, my life, and my integrity. The Kavanaugh case has an all too familiar taint, doesn't it? Detailed, legitimate concerns should be dealt with in the FBI background check process or then followed up at, uh, of course, in the public hearings, not in this 11th hour media circus. Joining us now with reaction is Megan McCaleb. She's one of 65 women who knew Kavanaugh in high school who wrote a letter supporting him. Helgi Walker worked with Brett Kavanaugh in the White House Counsel's Office and Porter Wilkinson is a former clerk for Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, Helgi, uh, let's start with you. Uh, of, of the entire panel, probably y you've known Brett Kavanaugh the longest, and I'm livid about what they're doing to him. I can imagine you are as well. Your reaction? Laura, you and I have been friends with Judge Kavanaugh. We used to call him Brett for 25 years. I've also worked with him in the White House Counsel's Office side by side every day. He treated me like a serious lawyer, like his equal, like his teammate in every fashion. He took me seriously. He debated issues with me. This is a man who treats women with the utmost respect, courtesy. He's a complete gentleman. He's a kind and a gentle and a decent person. And it makes me upset too, Laura, that somebody who is willing to be on the Supreme Court, who we are fortunate to have a person of those qualifications be willing to serve, to be smeared like this at the very last minute with such an obvious attempt to try to stop him or at least tarnish him in some way because some people just can't accept the fact that he is so well qualified oh, and, get and that he is going to yeah. be on the Supreme Court. Uh, Megan, I want to go to you because there has been some whispering around Washington about this letter, the 65 uh, classmates who signed this letter in support of Judge Kavanaugh. And it, it was said that this letter had been written long ago. Is that, is that the case? Because I know you signed it. I just want to clear that up once and for all. No, it is, that is absolutely not the case. We got wind of this yesterday. From My husband received a call from a reporter with those, those allegations, and we, we couldn't believe it. Absolutely couldn't believe it. I've known Brett since I was a freshman in high school, and we knew we had to rally around him. I mean, you, so you've known him since high school. You, you've known him uh, longer than even we have. And is anything in his character indicate behavior such as that is alleged today? Again, by an anonymous person in a letter that, that uh, Feinstein sat on since July. Anything in his background or character? Absolutely nothing. He always treated us with girl, girls with respect, always. And it was simple to find 65 women to sign that letter from five different high schools everybody jumped on board and was happy to sign it on his behalf and they all saw it and agreed with it i have to say i think this is a big embarrassment for the me too movement there are legitimate claims that have been raised and voiced and people put their names behind those claims and accusations even if they're long ago this is someone who refuses to give her name for whatever reason and it ends up in the hands of diane feinstein and never released 
Porter, I have to ask you about this. What about those circumstances? Diane Feinstein doing this in this way? Well, um, I'm not a political commentator, and so I don't have a lot to say about oh, shucks. <laughs> the way that um, <laughs> Diane Feinstein has handled this, besides for the fact that I believe that she takes the concerns of women seriously, and if she thought that there was a serious, credible allegation here, that she would have come forth sooner and said something um, and during the FBI background check or the hearing. Tell us about uh, Judge Kavanaugh, the boss. Uh, I was a law clerk to Judge Kavanaugh in 2007 and 2008, and I worked closely with him day in and day out, helping him prepare for cases and decide cases. And he is unfailingly kind and respectful and a man of the highest character, unassailable integrity. And these allegations are flatly inconsistent with the man that I've known well for over a decade. You know what's amazing, uh, uh, ladies, is that there was a tweet from Obama's uh, top guy, Brian Fallon, the campaign, or the Hillary's, uh, Hillary's campaign, excuse me. Um, and he tweeted this out today in response to this Emily Singer tweet. Emily Singer tweeted, makes the whole bring in the daughter's basketball team and talk about how great a coach he was look even more transparent. And then Fallon tweets back and his emphasis on hiring women clerks. I'd like you to respond to that. So in other words, he hired female clerks for 12 years in anticipation of being nominated to the Supreme Court, Porter. Yeah. Laura, I'm not alone in my assessment of Judge Kavanaugh. I think you know that women from every phase of his life have written letters to the Senate Judiciary Committee supporting his nomination. Every single one of his female clerks who wasn't prohibited from signing a letter based on their current employment vouched for his character, his integrity, the fact that it is because of him that they are succeeding in their careers. Uh, there is a moment in an interview I did with Justice Thomas last November. Was when we just started the Ingram angle about whether this whole process and what he went through, again, an 11th hour hit, uh, a leaked FBI memo um, that was already investigated by the FBI and, and dismissed uh, accusations by Anita Hill. And this is what he said, let's watch. 28 years ago, um, you went through the worst confirmation spectacle in history. Was it worth it? I think we are called to do certain things. I don't think anyone would choose to go through unpleasantness, but if it has to be that, to do what is right, then so be it. Helgi. Well, I clerk for Justice Thomas like you did, Laura. We're part of that special family, and it's just so disappointing that the confirmation process and the Senate Judiciary Committee has sunk so low. We could be having a conversation about the Constitution. We could be having a con conversation about the 300 opinions that Judge Kavanaugh has written. We could be talking about the future of our country. Instead, we're talking about trash, smut, anonymous allegations, and even Justice Ginsburg yesterday, a liberal icon, a fighter for women's rights, respected by so many people across the aisle, said the confirmation process the way it is now is wrong. So if liberals don't believe Justice Ginsburg, then I don't know who they'll listen to. Uh, Megan, have you been in touch with Judge Kavanaugh? How is he doing? How is his family doing throughout uh, this process? It certainly was rough in that confirmation hearing, especially when they had the planned protests and you had, uh, you know, all the usual suspects disrupting the proceedings for so long. You know, I saw them at the hearings and they're doing as well as to be expected. No. Well, uh, there was one Thanks moment. Um, there was one moment uh, last night, and uh, I want you guys to respond. Maybe Helgi. This is Lawrence O'Donnell uh, raising this issue of this allegation. Let's watch. The fact that the senator and uh, Congresswoman Eshoo issued statements about it today and took this step, Senator Feinstein took the step to the FBI, was what is where we are now, and we do not know where we're going to be tomorrow. No, this is, I mean, we, we, we overuse the word unprecedented, mm -hmm. but for Supreme Court nominations, even with the Clarence Thomas background, uh, this is absolutely unprecedented. It really is. <laughs> this is just so pathetic. I'm sorry. Even that morning Joe this morning had to say, this is kind of, I mean, even they were, they can't stand Trump at Morning Joe. Even they were saying, eh, come on, guys, this is, now this is, this is, you've made a mockery of the Senate confirmation process for the Supreme Court. Look, we have all these incredibly impressive women. Uh, Porter, who's not a political person, decided to come on and put her, her name out there tonight. Obviously, uh, Megan, you did the same thing. Helgi, you have better things to do. But you're out here 
to, to stand against unfairness. And I would like American women to know that all of the women on this set today are accomplished, impressive women, excluding myself, oh, who yeah, have right. things to say, and we all think he's great. And would you take the we word do. of people who've known him for 25 years, or would you listen to this ridiculous last minute character assist? Uh, all of you, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Porter, Helgi, Megan, and what an embarrassment uh, for the media. First, this desperate attempt to smear Kavanaugh. Then they reported a story about a U.S. ambassador uh, early this morning that turns out to be totally false. The New York Times hit piece indicated that Nikki Haley had spent nearly $53,000 indicated on curtains in her residence in New York, except guess what? It wasn't Trump's State Department. It was Obama's. So the Times is now walking back that story. I, I guess it, like, if you're going to do a hit job, don't fall flat on your face, my friends. Joining me now, the reaction is Howie Kurtz, the host of Media Buzz, which airs Sundays here on FNC. Howie, how are you? Big news night for a Friday night. And yeah. I, we have to hit this Nikki Haley thing first sure. because... It, this seems reminiscent of what the Ben Carson spending too much money and Scott Pruitt flying around on and now it's Nikki Haley. Something didn't just it didn't ring true to me when I heard it. What really happened? One of the worst headlines I have ever seen in the New York Times or any other newspaper trying to paint Nikki Haley as some kind of out of control, Scott Pruitt spending tens of thousands of dollars on unnecessary luxuries. Except when you read down to the fourth paragraph of the story, it says that, that she had nothing to do with this purchase of these $50,000 curtains. It was the Obama State Department, as you say. And the editor's note says, well, gee, we created an unfair impression and we should not have focused on Nikki Haley. What was missing is two things. One is the story should have been obliterated blown up, digitally erased, because it has no longer has any reason to be, and there should be an apology from the paper to Nikki Haley. Yeah, I mean, I saw that there was an editor's note. Who reads an editor's note? That's like way down at the bottom of the story. I mean, is it, is, is that, that's it? They were able to do that at the New York Times, assail her character, which essentially is what it was, and then add a little blip at the end? Well, at least there was some acknowledgement of all the criticism with the editor's note. I just don't think the editor's note went far enough. Not only was it a bad headline, when when you say that it was unfair to yeah. frame this as a Nikki Hell expenditure, then the story simply has no reason But Howie, they should be publishing above the fold uh, in tomorrow's paper a print edition if they want to gain a shred of credibility back. Because the New York Slimes, I'm sorry, it's what they are now, is proving themselves to be another extension of the DNC. That's all it is. DNC, Obama... Hillary, whatever it is, but it, it, the old gray lady is, is you know, it should be red, red faced with shame after just that one piece. I got to ask you about this Ronan Farrow uh, getting this memo, though, uh, today. And mm -hmm. again, it's the same letter that Dianne Feinstein gets. He gets it. Then he goes on TV and starts talking about it. Well, he has even the Pulitzer Prize. He has a, he has a lot of credibility in reporting these issues. Obviously, Weinstein, what NBC did to stop that story and other cases like it. But I was kind of surprised that he decided to kind of like go on television and talk about this, given how thin and how old and how uncorroborated this particular allegation is. Yeah. Well, before Ronan Farrow did that today, I think most of the media were sort of cautious about what had all the earmarks of a late hit. I mean, mysterious letter, anonymous accuser about something that may allegedly have happened when Brett Kavanaugh was 17 years old. But Ronan Farrow, because of his credibility in reporting on Harvey Weinstein and on Les Moonves, uh, sort of gave the rest of the media cover to now go on TV and yak about it. He did, he did not interview this woman. He got a hold of the memo. And, you know, Big I deal. admire... I admire his reporting, but I think it's fair to point out that he worked for the Obama State Department. Uh, I, it, I, again, I will say, what he did on the other stories, that's called shoe leather reporting. This is taking a little gift wrapped up from Dianne Feinstein and going on television and say, okay, everybody else, you're clear. You have covered to go off and talk about this as if it's some, uh, something that happened you know, five years ago in his, uh, in his office over there at the D.C. Circuit. I, I, I am, I'm telling you this is an insult to real assault cases and real sexual harassment. Women who've been victimized should see this for what it is, a pure political attack, late hit on a great man. Uh, I really appreciate you. Go ahead, last word. No, I mean, we just don't know the details there. because the accuser is anonymous. And unlike Anita Hill, who at least testified and was cross-examined, uh, the media need to be extraordinarily careful, Laura, about not being used in an right. 11th hour smear.
I appreciate it, Howie Kurtz. And Paul Manafort has accepted a plea deal with the special counsel, Bob Mueller, and Trump haters celebrating. Joe DeGeneva explains why they may, want, might want to save the confetti, plus some explosive new text between Strzok and Page. All that next. No evidence of obstruction. There have been four guilty pleas now, and they're completely irrelevant. That was Rudy Giuliani moments ago with Sean Hannity shredding the narrative of the resistance after Paul Manafort agreed to plead guilty in a deal with special counsel Bob Mueller today. And despite the media proclamations all day long, we still don't know that Manafort is cooperating with Mueller's team against President Trump. Joining me now to break it all down, Joe DeGeneva is a former U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., and Kendall Coffey, former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Florida. Gentlemen, great to see both of you. Joe, you said earlier today, I believe, that this is, uh, this is a Potemkin village. This is a mirage. Tell our uh, viewers why that is. Well, this was done for the benefit of Mr. Mueller and the benefit of Mr. Manafort. It accomplishes absolutely nothing. It has nothing to do with Mr. Mueller's mandate. Uh, it, it prevents uh, Mr. Manafort from getting consecutive time. It also prevents Mr. Mueller from having to go through a trial and waste resources. And it also permits Mr. Uh, Manafort to cooperate in the ongoing investigation by Mueller of Tony Podesta uh, and of others, including um, Gregory Craig, of the formerly of the law firm Skadden Arps. So all in all, uh, I would say the walls are closing in, but not on the president. Uh, Kendall, I want to go to you because Alan Dershowitz called this a big deal today. He said, you know, basically this was not great news for the administration. He also then discussed the issue of a possible pardon and the timing of a pardon for, for Paul Manafort. Let's watch. I think once he agrees to cooperate, he has to cooperate about everything. There's no such thing as partial cooperation. The question is, did he cooperate too late? Would he have been better off cooperating before his first trial? I think he was perhaps hoping for a pardon. And then the question comes up, did the president act too late? If he was going to pardon, he'd have been much better off pardoning early rather than waiting until he's already cooperated. Kendall, your thoughts on the pardon issue and the overall uh, development today with the Manafort play? Well, it doesn't look like a pardon is going to happen. Manafort may have waited for one, hopefully, and then decided he had to throw in the, the towel. But I, I don't agree that this is a major, major event. Manafort really had no choice after he lost the first trial. And if indeed he had the goods on the president, don't you think he would have been cooperating a long time ago if he had that kind of leverage? If we look at this set of criminal charges and compare it to Michael Cohen, now the Michael Cohen charges did try to take an aim at the president. This doesn't do anything like that. And in fact, if you look at the charges, rather than suggesting collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, it suggests collusion between Manafort and Democrats with respect to the uh, apparently allegedly illegal efforts to lobby on behalf of Ukrainian government forces. Yeah, and uh, before we get to the struck page text, Joe, the, you mentioned briefly Greg Craig, uh, former Obama White House counsel for the first year of the administration. He is uh, now, I guess they're weighing federal charges against him in the Southern District of New York uh, as an unregistered uh, foreign agent and against his old law firm, uh, Skadden Arps, which, full disclosure, I worked for 20 years ago. Uh, but th that's an interesting development. For people who haven't been following this, they're sucking up the, perhaps the Podestas, sucking up Greg Craig. Again, none of it related to Trump, but it is related to the idea of working on behalf of foreign countries and not disclosing it. So where's the collusion there? Well, there is none for, for President Trump and his campaign. There is plenty there for the Democrats, not only the derivation of the dossier and the working with Russian officials to generate it uh, through Christopher Steele, but it was obvious, and that's why Podesta, Tony Podesta, had to close his lobbying form because they had never registered as foreign agents. And that case was turned over, and it's now quite evident that the Southern District of New York is investigating both Gregory Craig for his role in the uh, undisclosed Ukraine work in the United States and Mr. Podesta. Um, this is all quite good for the president because it makes his point quite beautifully and yeah. I must say some with some fashion. 
this is this is where the rubber meets the road. There never has been any evidence of collusion by the president of the United States and his campaign. And actually, the plea by Manafort today simply underscores that. Yeah, and it's not clear that Manafort is cooperating on on Trump. Could be cooperating on the on the Greg Craig uh, Podesta issue instead. I want to move on though to another big story. Tonight, more explosive text just released between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, and it includes this exchange. Check it out from December 19th, 2016, right after the election. Strzok texts Page the following. It will make your head spin to realize how many stories we played a personal role in. Page responds, sheesh, this has been quite a year, and forwards a link to the New York Times most read stories of 2016. Kendall? Uh, what does this tell you about uh, the paramours' involvement with the media in setting a narrative against Trump and his his associates? Yes, yeah, deeper and worse than we thought. And we already thought it was it was pretty bad. They talked about stopping the Trump candidacy. Now they're orchestrating a media campaign. And by the way, throwing some things in there, how they're going to maybe set up some pretexts for interviews, uh, coordinating ongoing leaks obviously aimed at uh, the, the Trump administration. So this is a serious thing. And what's going to be difficult is trying to understand and nail down how much influence did they have on others who were involved. They were high-ranking people. Uh, they were involved at critical periods during all of this. But wh where does the uh, influence end and, and how do we diagnose just how much of a taint there is on this? Yeah. And, uh, and, and Lindsey Graham, of course, has called for a second special counsel, Joe DeGeneva. I, you know, Jeff Sessions, you know, God bless him, Rod Rosenstein. Like, how, uh, this is screaming investigation. We have the, we have the inspector general investigation ongoing. Uh, but w this needs a Justice Department regular process investigation or a special counsel. This is ridiculous. The, the, setting up a pretext for, for interviews of Trump officials based on uh, leaks that they uh, planted in the media. So it's like this, it's this feedback loop in order to, to get the Trump folks. This, this, is, this is, they call Trump a, an autocrat? This is, this is been, maddening. As I've been saying for two years, there was a brazen plot to illegally exonerate Hillary Clinton in the email case. And then if she lost, to frame Donald Trump. And that is exactly what these texts are about. Whether or not Mr. Strzok and Lisa Page and others are indicted is certainly a question people can debate. But let me just say, I know that there is a grand jury underway. Uh, testimony is being taken about Strzok, Page, McCabe, and others involved in this case. And the reason we know it is that James Baker, the former general counsel of the FBI, has turned state's evidence and is fully cooperating with the inspector general and with the federal grand jury. I can assure you, Mr. Comey has been very silent in recent weeks. And the reason is very simple. He knows he's going to be indicted. Wow, pretty explosive on a Friday night. Joe and Kendall, thanks so much. And up next, some appalling comments from Chelsea Clinton about abortion and the reboot that Les Moonves should be most worried about. Our Friday Folly segment with Raymond Arroyo coming up. And we'll head back to North Carolina for a live update on Florence's incredibly destructive path. Don't move. currently inundating the Carolinas with unprecedented rainfall, wreaking havoc across the region, power outages in the hundreds of thousands. For more, let's go to Fox News correspondent Leland Vittert. Leland, last time I, we talked was this morning on radio, but last night you had made very, very close friends with a beautiful, tall, lanky lamppost. So what does tonight bring, Leland? <laughs> Well, my, my savior, the lamppost, is over there. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamppost. You saved me uh, last night. Boy, what a difference 24 hours makes. You probably wouldn't want to go for a romantic stroll here uh, in Moorhead, North Carolina. Uh, but it's not that terrible out. We still have the rain coming down. We've had 24 inches so far here. And that's going to be really the story 
of Florence. There is wind damage clearly over on Atlantic Beach. There's roofs blown off. There's stores destroyed, but not utter devastation sometimes that you see with really huge, huge, powerful hurricanes. This is going to be a flooding hurricane, which means it's going to take another couple of days to figure out just how bad this is. Already talked to the captain of one of the boats that's normally here. He said there are parts now that his friends can't get to, that no one can get to, that are completely cut off and destroyed as the floodwaters continue to rise. He said, though, the most important thing about people here is, is they come together as a community. All of these are small communities. He said, we don't ask for help. We don't need it. We just get it done. And uh, coming up, there's going to be a lot to get done, Laura. Uh, Leland, please stay safe out there. And it's good to see you tonight. Uh, and uh, great work all throughout this hurricane, which uh, means, that, you know, look, it's Friday. And what does that mean? It's time for Friday Follies. Chelsea Clinton may need to atone after some remarks about she, about abortion that she just made. Chelsea Clinton uh, is in a little bit of hot water because she made a remark about uh, an issue which well, is she, a little a little rough in religion which yeah. is the problem yeah well for answers we're joined by new york times best-selling author of the will wilder series fox news contributor raymond arroyo raymond chelsea was on sirius xm radio today made some alarming remarks what's going on yes she did listen to this lord this is a town hall meeting a left of center one she's clearly setting herself up for a political run watch when i think about um all of the statistics that um are are painful of what women are uh, confronting Zerlina today in our country and what uh, even more women confronted uh, pre-Roe, we just can't go back to right. that. Like that's uh, unconscionable to me. Um, and also, and I'm sure that this will unleash uh, another wave of hate in my direction, <laughs> but as a deeply religious person, it's also unchristian mm -hmm. to me. So it's unchristian to stop people from having abortions. Now, look, no matter where you stand on this issue, and it is a deeply hurtful issue for a lot of people, and a, and a wrenching one, to suggest that people who defend life are somehow acting in an unchristian manner, okay, the men okay, and women yeah. who, through their religion, believe their religion compels them to protect innocent life. This is, th these are remarks that I think people are gonna well, be and, outraged. And she says, well, it's gonna unleash hate. No, it. It, it not unleashes hate, it's disbelief. Like you can we disagree about this issue, but it's almost, you're, you're questioning the Christian beliefs of those who believe it's right to protect the most vulnerable. Right, and you remember, you remember a month ago, she said uh, abortion actually contributed $3.5 trillion to the economy because all those, the mothers then went into the workplace because they were free of How having children. How about those millions what of about babies the, who weren't born? Right, who weren't contributing to the economy. It, all of this reminded me of Nancy Pelosi, who you remember the theologian in 2008 had this to say. When As an ardent practicing Catholic, uh, this is an issue that I have studied for a long time. And what I know is over the centuries, the doctors of the church have not been able to make that definition. And a Senator, uh, I'm a Senator, uh, St. Augustine said at three months, you don't know. St. Augustine considered abortion evil violence and said it was deeply immoral. So Nancy Pelosi, I mean, she's many things. She can whip up votes, theologian, I, I Move over St. Thomas Aquinas because yeah. Nancy Pelosi is in town. Laura, as you know, Les Moonves was ejected from CBS after six more women came forward accusing him of abuse. And the CBS board is investigating to see how big of a severance package he'll get. Now, his wife, Julie Chen, appeared finally on Big Brother, a show she has hosted for 18 years. Here she is last night as she closed out the hour. Watch. I'm Julie Chen Moonves. Good night. The first time she has ever identified as Julie Chen Moonves as a sign of support for her husband. I, I thought Les was going to pop out of that door. <laughs> he was going to be. He, well, that would have been more fun. Well, had the cameras, Hi, I'm back. Had the cameras of Big Brother been in the CBS hallways, we might so you know, really have a show on our this hands. This was the finale. That, well, that Big was Brother. the finale of that for the season. But other women at CBS from days past are now coming forward, like Linda Bloodworth Thomason, who was responsible for designing women. She has a harrowing account where she says he ended her career and killed many 
shows with women in the lead. She wrote one thing in The Hollywood Reporter. This is kind of terrifying of a, of a, a major actress. She said, coming off the cancellation of her iconic detective show, the star began pitching a new one. He informed her that she was too old to be on the network. She began to cry and stood up to go. He stood up, took her by the shoulders, telling her, I can't let you leave like this. She reacted, suddenly touched. Then he shoved his tongue down her throat. I know this happened because the star is the person who told me. It is believed that that star is probably Angela Lansbury, who was getting 40 million viewers a week when her show was canceled. Linda Murder, Bloodworth Thompson, good friends with well, the Clintons, remember. Right. Friends with well, the Clintons. now Designing Women is coming back. So is Murphy Brown. But there's one reboot that I can promise you, Les Moonves will not want to see again. <laughs> I think she, it'll be a murder she does if, if Lansbury comes back and it'll be Les Moonves on the other end of that one. So he won't, you won't be seeing that reboot. Julie, Julie Chen Moonves. <laughs> Julie Chen Moonves. Uh, just when we think, thanks, Raymond. And just when we think we've heard it all, Maxine Waters comes out with a new charge against the Trump administration. It may make your head explode just in time for the weekend. Stay there. By now, you might have thought that Maxine Waters' tank of insults against President Trump has run empty. But check out her latest diatribe from a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation event. In these United States, with the president the last of Donald Trump, I've never seen him in my life. I think he's the most deplorable, the most despicable human being I've ever encountered. I believe there has been collusion, and I'm just waiting on Lola, our special counsel, Joining us now with reaction is Horace Cooper, co-founder of Project 21, along with civil rights attorney Leo Terrell. Um, Horace, let's start with you. Uh, Maxine Waters is kind of the toast of the town. I mean, if you're someone who wants to impeach Trump and you're anti-Trump, Maxine Waters is kind of, she's, she's, she's what Ruth Bader Ginsburg is for the Supreme Court. She has the cool factor right now. But what of this, la what of this latest rant? Well, it demonstrates that everybody's time in the sun ultimately results in them looking foolish. Her trivializing chattel slavery from the 18th and 19th century and comparing it to what happens when people come to this country illegally is unbelievably over the top, unnecessarily overheated rhetoric. And it's painful to hear her say something like this and, and not be condemned by others. Yeah, Leo, so you know what we're talking about here. This is the actual quote of what Maxine Waters said. She said, I know it's right to fight against separation of mothers and fathers and families because of what happened to us in slavery. They sold us at the auction block. They sent the father to one plantation. They sent the children to other plantations. They separated us. So, Leo, is detaining illegal aliens akin to slavery now? That's where we are? I think, it's a, I think it's an excellent analogy, and I'll tell you one thing. When, when illegal aliens come to this country, some are coming for asylum seeking help. And what you're ignoring and what Horace is ignoring is trivializing what's happening. Separation of families that took place in slavery is taking place right now. The whole world condemned Trump in separating these there families is, right now. Okay, and both the, let me finish. And both of these issues, in both of these issues, you're talking about victims without any types of recourse or redress. I think it's an excellent analysis, and it magnifies the, the the horrible situation. One last point. Ivanka and Melanie felt the same thing. Melania felt the same way about Trump separating these families. It's horrific. Okay, it's well, horrific. That, that's, a that's, a, that, that's fine. And I think a lot of people didn't like that at all. But it's a different question. Yes. And I'm, I'm trying to just examine this dispassionately, really, because everybody knows where I stand on immigration. Do criminals get separated from their children? All the time. Every day of the week, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, uh, people from all different walks of life. If you commit a crime, sometimes you commit a crime that's not a felony. Maybe it's a, a serious misdemeanor. But if you can't put up the bail, well, you actually do time. And if you do time and you have kids, you're not with the kids because the kids can't be jailed with you, nor should they be. So the idea that that's you just, you somehow just, slavery when we didn't bring them to the United States, bringing someone unlawfully to your country to use them for labor, that is hideous but, and that is human subjugation. To have penalties for people who violate our laws, 
I don't see how that is, in this case, re akin to slavery, one of the worst sins of human history. Respectfully, Laura, you just broad stroke every illegal alien who comes to the country. And I think you know, respectfully, they come here for different reasons. We don't know every why illegal they come here. We, we, that's that's, that's to, not what to, the law says. The law does not does not say if you come here and you ha and you have three children and you want to get a job in L.A., then it's OK. That's not what the law says. If the law said that, I would agree with you, Horace. Okay. I don't want to shortchange you here. Uh, but on this issue, I think Maxine Waters, as popular as she is among among some on the left, I think there are a lot of sort of regular folks say, OK, I didn't like that policy. Maybe I, did, I felt terrible for those children. But that's. Mm, I don't know. That's just taking it way too far. Well, absolutely. And by the way, for folks who use the race card for every single option to now turn around and say it can be just as casually used for people who come to this country. And by the way, a few of them do come for asylum. But the overwhelming majority come here voluntarily to work. They seek to engage in labor, and they do so unlawfully. For those people to be treated the same as someone grabbed, kidnapped, put on a ship, and brought here and forced to work over their own will? This whole country, we fought a civil war over this. That's how serious that was. This trivial, it trivializes that. Leo. I think Maxine Water has the credibility to make this analogy. And more importantly, thank you for acknowledging a few who are coming, some of these illegals who come over here for asylum. Also, they're forced to come over here. They're exploited. So let's be very what? clear. <laughs> Every illegal alien that comes over this, oh, they're exploited. Oh you know that. God. You can laugh all you want, but they're exploited. Then don't come. You know come. that for a fact. It's horrific. They're exploited by, by whom are they exploited? The drug, the drug cartels or the human traffickers or the employers here who want to seek, uh, who seek to keep wages low? I mean, I've, they, they are exploiting them. I agree with you. But that's not slavery. You made a decision to violate another country's sovereignty by crossing our border. And, and, and whatever country you go to and you do that, there are going to be penalties. Are there not, Leo? What, 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 what crime do the children commit, Laura and Horace? What We're not crime talking the about the children. We're not talking punished. about the children. They're, they're, We're they're talking evolved. about separating they're children. Let's just admit they're, they're it was over yeah. the top. And she shouldn't have over said the top. it. Let's just say it. Admit that. All right, guys. Thank you so much. No, I'll tell you and right now. I think it's a great. I think it's a great position. Okay. Well, thanks so much, guys. Speaking of uh, fear mongers, Barack Obama 